This is a re wonderful refinement of Fermat test. Remember, Fermat test just says, let us take a number, let's take a witness, some, something smaller than this number, raise it to n minus 1, and compare, and compare it with 1. By the way, I assume that everybody, why is raising something to some gigantical power is actually fast? Because we have this wonderful Russian peasant algorithm. We could go by powers of two. That's what we spent so many lectures studying. Right? It is logarithmic. Right? So instead of doing 10 to the 100 test, we're going to do, roughly speaking, something like 300 tests, which is acceptable. Computers are awfully fast. So this is why sort of testing Fermat or testing this somewhat more rigorous test called miller bin is actually fast. So there were two, two, two people, Miller and Rabin, who came up with the refinement of Fermat test, which possesses the following remarkable property, which Fermat test does not guarantee because of these evil Carmichael numbers. This is miller rabin test says that if you pick a random witness, you try it, you are not going to be fooled with probability 75% only 25% probability that it could be full. It's actually much, much less, but it's provably at most 25%. Right? So the test is a slight modification of Fermat. It depends on the following idea. It says, let us take n and decompose n minus 1. n minus 1 is even. Why? Because, well, most of us are not going to test n when it's even for primality. We'll figure out it's probably not prime. So as n minus 1 is odd, n, n is odd, n minus 1 is even. We could factor out all the 2's, yes? So we could represent it as 2 to the k, all the 0 bits, time q, where q is odd. Any number could be done like that. Very simple. And then we depend on the following fact. In order to, to understand Rabin's test, we have to remember and on top of Fermat is the, unique, the uniqueness of self-invertible elements. They're just 1 and minus 1. That is, the only guys who could give us 1 when squared are going to be 1 or minus 1. If n is prime, remember for 8, 8 is both bad number, and so there are many other bad numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to do Fermat in steps. First, we will compute 2 to the q, uh, witness to the q. We'll raise witness to the q power. If it's 1, then maybe it's prime. If it's not 1, our logic is going to be like that, that we're going to be squaring it, and it's better, we better get minus 1 before we get 1. That we are assuring that there is no path through squaring to get to 1 before first getting to minus 1. Right? This is this very little code which does that, but that's the idea. Keep going and checking that sort of we didn't get we didn't get to one. If we did get to one, bad things happen. Okay. We are not allowed to get to one without getting to minus one. That's the rule. And if we strengthen this test again. Just this, this is all it does. It's three lines, but it it's fundamentally goes through 
squaring things. And if you encounter one before encountering minus one, you know you failed. By the way, if you reach the end and you never encountered minus one, you're doomed. Because, you know, it's not applying. So it's a very, very robust test. It's actually much better than what we know. Because if some obscure conjecture from number theory holds, and everybody in the world believes that it holds, called extended Riemann hypothesis, then it deterministically finds out whether thing prime or not prime with very small number of tests. But again, we do not have a proof for that. So what do we do? And this is what we use when we generate primes for RSA. We use this very code sufficient number of times. It used to be thought that 25 was sufficient. I think now the common wisdom is you have to do 100. So, but doing 100 is just four times slower, and computers are awfully slow. So when you are going to be finding large prime numbers, that is the code you will have to use. Of course, I'm not giving you everything you need, because what else you need? You need a way of generating large witnesses. You need some way you will need to get. I already gave you the multiplication operation. Remember, here I sort of just to make you happy, I gave you this. But you will have to find a big num package on the web and install it. And you know, there are some people here who know about how to get things from the web. Ryan is very good, for example. So, uh, but you know, I am not an expert. Uh, there are several packages. I do not want to recommend any one of them because I actually want you to tell me which one is good. So again, you have to find these big num packages. It's, it's, it's not much work. It's not much work, but again, it is work. Then you need to generate these large numbers and test them 100 times and then return them when they're not. But the core, sort of the only code which, which requires thinking is this one, and you could use cut and paste. I would recommend in order that you you actually do it successfully that you f work through this page. Because my experience is that if I rely on code without at all understanding what it does, I usually do something unbelievably stupid. So uh, at least read the precondition. You know, this is, this is good. You know, uh, so uh, like if it says Q is odd, it should be odd. You know, the, uh, by the way, anybody could explain to me why the interface I'm taking n, q, k, and witness. Why don't I just pa pass n and then factor it out? Yes, Anil is correct. You see, we're going to use it 100 times. And it's really annoying 100 times to, to factor. By the way, and if we do, is it going to affect performance significantly? Let me tell you, not at all. Because doing this is so much more overwhelmingly complicated than factoring out n into k and q that it doesn't matter. But you know, we should do things properly, even with, when we don't have to. OK, so what does miller rabin guarantee that it's wrong at most 25%? Now, I had to use this quote from Knuth because it's just so beautiful. He says that the likelihood of its being wrong is less than computer being wrong due to cosmic radiation. And if Knuth says so, it must be true. So uh, in any case, Knuth recommends right there. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, no, no. But again, here it's a difficult thing. No, we do not know that, but it is commonly believed that it is. Okay? Sort of, if you could prove independence, it would be a good contribution. But as far as I know, again, sort of, there is a very strong evidence. Again, I, I actually believe that if you test all witnesses smaller than log n, then it's deterministic test. Because I actually believe in extended Riemann hypothesis <laughs> being true. But it's, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, it works in practice. We have this sort of probabilistic guarantee. There is strong evidence that it works. How strong? Well, there are billions and billions of these numbers being used in RSA generation since the 70s, right? And so far, nobody ever issued a non-prime instead of prime, right? So, sort of the, it's not just this test, but the overall, the, this is a very reliable. This goes back to, to sort of what would I rather trust? A more complicated algorithm, which we will talk in a second, which guarantees primality or probabilistic algorithm, which has been tested for 30 years. I would rather trust my money we're talking about money, to the probabilistic algorithm because it has been extensively tested. Every time people have been talking about let us try something else, there's a huge reluctance on the part of the crypto community to do it because they say, look, I mean, this might not be perfect, but it has been tried so much. There are many, so many people who tried to break it, who tried to find flaws. It appears to work. Right? Of course, there was a recent article which many of you read, Ron is wrong and Wit is right, which shows you that when you pick random numbers, you have to exercise some care to make them random. For example, if indeed I will issue the same random numbers to just about everyone, my public key crypto system is not particularly <laughs> reliable. But that, that's not here nor there. It's not the fault of the crypto system. It's I'm an idiot. Uh, I mean, if I issue the same key to everyone, and then I discover that people could read each other's bank accounts. Yeah, sure, yes, that's how it works. So, uh, well, in 2002, there was a remarkable event. Two undergraduate students in Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur managed to come up with a deterministic algorithm for primality test. And uh, then the advisor put it in a paper and published it. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's literally true that the sort of the fundamental discovery was published as two bachelor theses. One of the greatest discoveries of the last 10 years were done by these two kids the, this is the advisor. Uh, these are two kids who were literally kids. I mean, they were like 21 years old. Remember Galois? They were like Kim. They did this wonderful thing. They, again, it's fundamentally based on the same ideas we were discuss, discussing, but sort of going a bit further. Again, I, you know, I would confuse you if I, if I attempt to present it, not just in short time, but even in a long time. I'm, I'm giving you a very good reference for those of you who want to read this remarkable result. So now we have a deterministic algorithm. Do we use it? No, because our probabilistic algorithm is still considerably fast. But if people are prepared to go on faith versus wait long. But the fact is remarkable, and these three guys, by the way, Agrawal is a very good guy, so what I'm joking that he was just, he didn't steal, I mean, he, he partitioned the work, he, he guided the sort of research. But the fact that the fundamental discovery was done by two undergraduates on the problem which 
again, every number theorist has been working for centuries, is amazing and should inspire you all. I mean, you say, could I do it? Well, these two guys could. And they were not particularly, again, sort of, I would make following claim that sort of each and every one of you putting few months into it would learn enough could learn enough mathematics to follow their work. It's not that difficult. It's difficult. And, uh, you know, so what I recommend, I put on the wiki, not their paper, their paper I find more diff much more difficult. There is a Canadian number theorist, Andrew Granville, who wrote a wonderful exposition, which is highly recommended, but only for determined people. Right? This, this paper is beautifully written. It's very easy, but it will require sweat and blood. It is, it's not, it's above Harry Potter in terms of reading <laughs> blood. So, again, I'm just warning, so don't come to me and say, Alex, you told us to read this paper. It's difficult. Yes. I mean, it's 25 pages of, but again, what I claim that any, anybody in this room who decides to get to it can get to it, which is astonishing from my point of view, that one of the most marvelous results, recent result, is within reach. For example, it's absolutely not the case in case of last Fermat theorem. That is, I could assure you that none of you will be able to understand Andrew Wiles' proof within next five years, most likely. I, I, you know, for most people, I would say ever. I mean, it's, it's just, it requires lifetime of stuff. I mean, it's very, very technical. It's, it's, not, it's not accessible to non, 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 non professional. It's just, it's just so. Uh, I'm not saying you're stupid. It's just the amount of stuff is enormous, which you need to learn. Uh, here, the amount of stuff is, is small. A determined undergraduate in an engineering school, and I suspect all of you were determined undergraduates in an engineering school at some point in your life, or any other school. My poor boss, Dan, was at Harvard studying philosophy, but even he could, <laughs> could fi figure it out. Uh, you know, if he puts a very, very serious effort, again, I, I'm not recommending that he does. I mean, you know, or it's, 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 it's a lot of effort. But it's, it's just wonderful that it's, you know, okay? Crypto. I mean, all this, we were building it up, we have to come to cryptology. And here we come to the point where I could spend infinite amount of time telling you stories about crypto system developed by Julius Caesar. George Wash uh, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington didn't do so, but uh, had a country to run. Uh, so, uh, and so on. But uh, instead of telling you the stories, I'm going to refer to you to a nice write-up of these stories, which I, uh, from my previous lecture notes at Adobe, I taught a similar course at Adobe. Uh, very different, but uh, so I, we cut a section with just the stories about cryptography and put it on the wiki. This, this I think all of you should read because it's just great fun. Uh, and uh, I also highly recommend uh, to read a story by Edgar Allan Poe entitled Gold Bug which is the first scientific treatment of cryptography ever published. It's a joke, but it's quite wonderful and scientifically accurate. A great story, too. So, uh, so re read my notes on, on the wiki. And right now, we will sort of few basic ideas. Plain text. Plain text is what you write. That's plain text, something you could read. Encryption. Encryption is a function which possibly takes key and plain text. 
and it's separated because you could sort of literally view it like that. You have a device, and I seen devices like that with my own eyes, where there is a device, and what you first you put the key in, you key in the key, and then you put the text, and it sort of encrypts the text. There are all kind of wonderful devices like that built in the 30s and the 40s, and a lot of what we do now comes from the efforts of especially British counterintelligence and people like Turing to break the encryption. Computer science is great degree came out of just let us break enemy ciphers. And still, you know, a lot of supercomputer industry basically survives because of non existing agencies. You know that there is NSA, what NSA stands for? No such agencies. So, I, mean, uh, I used to work for SGI, which was selling quite a few computers to non existing agencies. And you wouldn't believe, I mean, they, it's literally, you know, some secret drop spots. And, you know, you take your computer in the middle of the field, you drop it out. <laughs> some unmarked trucks come. You know, it's, it's com you know, the security is very important, and they, try, and they correctly try to maintain physical physical security. And uh, this is why there were enormous restrictions on selling supercomputers to Soviet Union. Uh, I don't think they were very effective, but nevertheless, I mean, the, they, they were motivated by, by the desire to prevent Soviets breaking American and code. We shall see, of course, the, the, the sad fact, and we shall see it in a second, that these people do amazing amount of stuff of which we have no idea. Because, like in the United States, in the former Soviet Union, in England, to a lesser degree, there are these remarkable research institutions. They work brilliant people. And what they do, we have no idea. Right? Sort of, we, we, we have one case of which we'll talk shortly. When we found out that you know, they actually discover everything before, before we know that. So for all I know, they, they could break. RSA. For all I know, they could fact a large price, but they're not telling us. So this is this is totally different universe, and I'll probably be arrested for giving this talk. So uh, it's you know, so plain text encryption, key ciphertext, ciphertext decryption with the key, not necessarily the same. Plain text. System is symmetric if it's the same key. Again, most systems during the war with the mechanical encoders were symmetric. The public key crypto system is specifically based on the idea that it is asymmetric, that there are two keys. Uh, I didn't see it very important. But, uh, so at some point, People came up with an idea, and uh, that you could have a public key crypto system, an encryption scheme where you have two keys. My key for say uh, this is interesting fact for encoding, which I throw out there, everybody could get it, and my key for decoding, which I keep in my pocket and do not show anyone. So what you could do now is that you could take this key, encrypt the stuff, and only I could decrypt it. Right? Sort of the, the idea is that it's really impossible for you, while you could easily encrypt, to find a decryption key. Again. The public key does not give you any clue to what the private key is. They are independent. As we shall see, they might not be quite independent, but they're independent enough that you cannot get it. It's just impossible to get it. Then, when Alice wants to send observe, 
if you want to appear to be a crypto savvy guys, you have to have two friends, Alice and Bob. Never you dare to say A and B or any other X and Y. It's always Alice and Bob who are sending messages to each other. That's just no crypto paper mentions any other people except Alice and Bob. So, uh, so Alice sends, I don't know, I mean, that's how it is. So Alice wants to send messages to Bob. She increased with Bob public key. Bob uses his private key to decipher her message. Right? That's a very simple idea. So, you know, that allows totally what seems to be totally secure communication. There are all kinds of attacks, which, which I, again, I don't want to go into sort of to turn it into cryptography course, but it's, I don't know why I said it. So uh, what are the requirements? The encryption function needs to be in one way function. That's a technical term, meaning that you cannot easily compute how to decrypt, right? And what one we mean hard, you, it's, a, it's a very precise term in computer science. When they say a problem is hard, it's an abbreviation for specifically exponential, right? So the problem cannot be solved in polynomial time. No way it could be solved in polynomial time. And exponential problems cannot be solved. They are intractable. Okay? It's not that they're undecidable. People confuse. There is the notion of undecidable things and then things which are intractable. But practically speaking, we have to understand that you know, if we have a, for example, there is a sort of some results where you have a decision procedure for something which is 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the n. Well, as far as you know, you might as well say there is no decision procedure because these numbers are just so humongous that we will never be able to, to solve it. So uh, exponential is hard enough. And if, if indeed, for example, uh, factoring is hard, our money is secure. So. Hard means exponential in the size of the key. Now, inverse function has to be easy to compute for me because I need to keep somehow generate a decryption function. I, if I come up with a great encryption function, which I cannot decrypt, it wouldn't be very practical. Even all the information is there. So it's very important to be able, for me, if I have extra information, known trap door, that's the extra information, to generate, to generate this extra function. And uh, therefore, I need to discover trap door one-way function. Another requirement, which is sort of right now, it goes often unstated. For example, I didn't list it, but Anil came and said, Alex, you have to say that. That's the last bullet that both functions have to be publicly known. It used to be the case that you wanted to keep your way you, you cipher things as secret. Now, believe it or not, it's the other way around. So if the requirement is, since it's a public system and I rely on it, you want me to publish code, to publish the algorithm, so everybody could check it. Right? So we rely on there, it's not some secret stuff. Everybody understands the algorithm. We just cannot break it. So this is a very new because it used to be that you know they will do something with your toenails if you disclose the encryption algorithms or you know worse things. Uh, I cannot even tell it. Corporate policy, well, uh, you know, what they would do to you, but. Uh, uh, so who invented it? Here we come with this amazing story. Of course, there are inventors we know and inventors we do not know. Apparently, everybody knows that Wood Diffie and Martin Hellman invented the whole idea of public key cryptography. Well, some people know that Merkel 
submitted the paper at the same time, but it wasn't reviewed for several months for no fault of his own. So he, but interestingly enough, there was a British spook who had more than a decade before that actually described it perfectly in his memo, but it was not published. And more importantly, then, so first Diffie and Hellman in the early 1772 come up with an idea. That is, they say, it would be terribly nice. This is, by the way, the story is quite fascinating. They, they say, it would be terribly nice to come up with a one-way trap door function. Except they don't. No. It would be nice to have, but they couldn't give you an example. They say, they believe one exists, but it's they believe. I mean, there is no evidence. So it took several years for Revest, Shamir, and Adel Edelman, that's why RSA, to publish the, the thing which we're going to study in a minute. Of course, the amazing thing that several years before, it was discovered and described by an English spook, Clifford Cox, the secret inventor. It took British government more than 20 years after the publication of RSA to declassify the memo. Think about it. I mean, it was all the world knew the results. But they waited 20 years before they said, well, but one of ours discovered it before. By that time, nobody was paying attention. Think about what 20 years means. You know, everybody forgets. When RSA came out, that was a big deal. And he was chugging along there in a very beautiful secret building called the Donut. Look for the Wikipedia. That's all the English, British spooks sit in the building called the Donut. And sort of working on his mathematics, but without any, any recognition, any acknowledgment. Then, uh, you know, in about 96, the British government decided that it's really stupid. We should claim the credit. So they claim the credit and give him CBE. That's a big deal. Uh, or was it OBE? One or, uh, either OBE, Order of British Empire, or CBE, command, commander. I do not remember. Is he Sir Clifford? He might be CBE. I think he's Sir Clifford. I forget. So he was acknowledged and, you know, sort of, he, he's doing all right now. Except nobody knows about him, except the British government and the Queen. She had to knight him, whatever. So, uh, sad, sad story. After that, that's not the end of the story. After that, Admiral Bobby Inman, the former head of no such agency, says, well, my guys did it in the 60s without without providing any evidence. <laughs> so he seems to be a decent guy. He's Jimmy Carter's friend. And you know, Jimmy Carter is a guy. I mean, he wasn't a good president, but he's a very honest guy. So, and Bobby Inman seems to be like that. But again, so there is this claim that so far, there were no claims from KGB, <laughs> which I'm sure they discovered in the 50s. <laughs> but, but. Uh, amazing story. I mean, I mean you know, uh, I am not even mentioning Chinese government. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, this is a uh, fascinating story, fascinating story. So, what is all this? Well, it's all very, very simple stuff. So, first, how do we generate key? We already discussed how to generate large primes. Remember large primes? So first, we generate two large primes. Could we do it? I mean, you believe now that we could do it by doing this miller bin test 25 times, according to Knuth, 100 times, according to me, whatever. We get two primes. Could we multiply them? We could, but before we do it, we have to download the big num package. Otherwise, tough. 
then we compute phi function of n. Well, I mean, it's actually very easy to compute phi function of n for us, since we know factors of n. So we just multiply p minus 1 by p minus uh, p sub 1 minus 1 by p sub 2 minus 1, and we get phi function. Everybody agrees? This, this is the formula which we got. I mean, that's, that's all right. So now, what do we do? We take a random number pub, so, I mean, public, which is co prime with this phi. And we will just see in a second how we could do it. I mean, here I have to borrow from the second journey. I mean, I try to be self sufficient, but I couldn't quite be. There is some math which we haven't covered, auxiliary math, generation of a co-prime. And more importantly, generation of multiplicative inverse. That's what, what, what is specifically difficult, right? So we generate co-prime, we generate its multiplicative inverse. You say, well, we need the code. You will be given the code in one second. So now you destroy these guys. Even you shouldn't keep them. They are gone. Right? What does it mean? That from that point on, what could becomes impossible to do? To factor. I mean, factoring becomes literally impossible. So how do we factor? Just we believe, again, remember, it's a matter of faith here. We believe that it's impossible. Of course, there are some secret people who probably could do it in no time. But we believe that the moment we erase these two numbers, there is no way to factor n, because it's a huge number with two gigantical factors. The trial and error is just no way it's going to work. Right? It's just no chance. So we destroy that. Then what we do? We publish public key and n. So n, we don't care. We give it away. Go try factoring it. We actually want our enemies to factor it, at least to try. Because you know the electricity bill goes up. The economy goes down. I mean, it's very good. So we want them to try to factor in because we do not believe they can do it. And pub, there is no way you could get pub without knowing what the fee function is. And to know what the fee function is, you need to, <laughs> to decompose it to primes. It's, I mean, we, we actually, it's sort of, we, we covered our uh, uh, steps, to our tracks. Right? So, and we keep the inverse of pub secret. That is the key generation. That's what you have to implement. Right? So, now, encode, decode. Well, the beauty of it, I'm actually giving you the full implementation right here. So to, if our math holds the implementation of the core encoding and decoding, by the way, do you see any difference between encoding and decoding? No, it's the same code, except one takes public key, another takes private key. Right? So you take your, again, there is some work you have to do. You get a long string. What do you need to do? You need to break it into blocks, say 256 bytes long, or pick a number. Right? You have to do it. You don't need much math to do it, hopefully. You break it into blocks. Then for every block, what you do, 
You need to have a package which allows you to view these blocks as int. Then you take plain text block with a public key and modular multiply, which I gave you the, the code. It's one line code. So, right? And you use our power semigroup. And it just does the encoding. And if you apply exactly the same thing but with private key, it will decode it back. We have to prove it, however, because now I'm just claiming it. So now for the proof. The proof is actually very simple. You see, remember, how did we generate private out of public? There are multiplicative inverses mod phi. That's by design. That's what we did. So what first we encrypt, well, I should have swiped it, but it doesn't matter. Should be like, this should say pub. So first we encrypt, and then we decrypt. And what it is, we multiply. I mean, you know, since it's commutative, it doesn't matter. So my bug is not really a bug. Uh, so we raise to, do you agree that that's how it is, the first line? Then by definition of a multiplicative inverse, it's equal to this. Yes? It's one plus some stuff. Which, by definition, is, what does it mean? It means m, m times 1, times m to the sum q phi function. Which, obviously, could be rewritten like that. Ah, oil Ethereum, guys. Oil Ethereum. What does Oil Ethereum say? That if we have a core prime and raise it to phi function, what do we get? We get 1. So 1 times m is m. Well, and I could raise 1 to any power I like. It's not going to change it much. This is all of, this is all of theorem right here. Well, how is M co-prime? Uh, OK, probabilistically, it's co-prime with sort of probability 1. But in reality, check. And if it isn't, stick an extra 1. Have a little buffer in your encoded block, just so as to account for this situation. Don't forget, you're cutting things in uh, equal size blocks. You could always keep the last byte of this block as the compensation bits, which I ignored for anything except for this core prime stuff. Uh, it never happens. I mean, these are <laughs> gigantic primes, so you know the <laughs> likelihood of hitting one is is literally. I mean, you have to you have to hit this or this, so nobody checks, and so far we're alive. But the solution. <laughs> But the solution is very simple. You could always just add one. Because if number is not co-prime, the next number for sure will be. I mean, with this, you know, you're not, I mean. So, uh, so this is all the math. And again, sort of this is the key that after we do de decomposition, observe that we are sort of depending on two modulus. We're doing this modular phi. And then we're dropping down here to mod n. Right? So you, you have to, there, there's something to ponder. But I actually, I think it's sort of self-evident. When you, again, how self-evident? It was a major discovery in the 70s. So not everybody <laughs> saw it. But after they published it, most people familiar with a little bit of number theory were saying, wow, it is trivial. This is always when you do something nice, everybody says, oh, it's trivial. I could have done it in my sleep. So, uh, but it's a position. Again, this stuff works only depending on things we believe. So factoring is hard. Therefore, people cannot compute fee. Because if they can, 
we're doomed. If people could, I mean, we're doomed in a sense, like there will be lots of money stolen from Amazon starting today. Right? So maybe it is. The, you know, these are, I don't know whether anybody verifies that, that you know, if you take one-tenth of one penny every time, nobody will notice it. You know, billions and billions will eventually come to your account. It's very tempting. Maybe it's, it's really happening. Huh? So factoring is hard. And then there is another amazing fact. If quantum computing is real, which I do not know. I mean, I actually sort of, I often, people often ask, so what do you think of quantum computing? I, I have no judgment. I have no idea if it's realizable or not. But if it is realizable, factoring becomes polynomial. So all of our public cryptography depends on the fact that quantum computing is not realizable because well, the, what you could, I could attempt, it's, it's less trivial than it sounds, but, you know, quantum computing could do lots of stuff in parallel of the same kind. So you basically could run two to the n division tests at the same time. So this is, is it science fiction or could it be done? I do not know. This is, I mean, literally my, my opinion, I spend time reading, I spend time, time talking to very, very brilliant people about it, and I still cannot pronounce to myself, not even publicly, any judgment on whether it's realizable, will be real, whether it's long-term, it's like controlled fusion. Tom and I are old enough, sort of, when we were very young, there was still articles in Scientific American about how fusion will change the world. They will build these donuts and they will fuse tritium with deuterium, or whatever. And there will be cheap energy for millions of years and paradise on Earth. They're still working. So there are, I mean, sort of whether quantum computing is like controlled fusion, harder, less hard, I have no opinion. So. When they declare victory tomorrow, don't, don't blame me. I, I have no opinion. I'm not saying it's impossible. No opinion. Okay, these are a couple of pieces of code which I'm giving you. If you could understand them, that's wonderful, but they come from the next journey. This is the thing which works. You don't know what Euclidean domains are. You don't know what extended GCD is. This is good. Because what you will, you will use it in this piece of code, which allows you to generate multiplicative inverse. So if you could figure out what the, all of that does, good. Otherwise, just use it to get multiplicative inverse. Why do you need multiplicative inverse? Because that's how you get private key out of public key or whatever, you know public key out of private key. It doesn't matter which one is first, which one is second. Right? So this is piece of code. I'm giving you the code for the key for doing multiplicative inverse. So this is your project. You're having two weeks, and there will be terrible public executions for people. No, this is not true. Corporate policy does not allow for, <laughs> <laughs> for policy. <laughs> for public research. <laughs> but try, guys. Uh, what, I mean, again, look, it's nothing in it for me. Uh, literally nothing, sort of. But you will make me happy if at least two of you do it. If more, I'll be even more happy. If nobody will do it, it will be really sad. That's the only thing I could tell you. So try to implement the two things you need to do. RSA key generation, being able to generate keys. Stand alone. I mean, this is one facility. And then another facility, implement RSA message encoder decoder. Right? And then try it with your friend. You have to have a friend. 
So every Alice has to find Bob. Every Bob has to find Alice and try to exchange things. Now, let me get to the, we got to the end of the journey, which makes me exceedingly happy because I was wondering whether I lived long enough as at least I lived long enough to finish the first journey, and where I still have some people in the room. Much fewer, but. Uh, so, what do I mean by spoils of the Egyptians? Some of you might recognize a literary allusion uh, to the ninth chapter of Exodus when Hebrews left Egypt. They went to their neighbors and asked for precious objects. And their neighbors were so happy, they gave them their precious objects. And Hebrews left with the precious objects. This, this is known as spoils of the Egyptians. So do I advocate that we should steal things from our neighbors? Yes, but in a very <laughs> specific way. That is, we have these wonderful old neighbors. They're called mathematicians. They have been doing things for centuries. I mean, one thing which I sort of tried to get across is that mathematics is very old. It's ancient. It's literally ancient. Right? It goes back 2,500 years to the times of Pythagoras. We will meet him in the beginning of the second journey again. You know, it's hard to get rid of some people. So what do we need to do? And that's a very difficult thing because we need to develop this wonderful thing of going and despoiling them, sort of taking their jewels, because these are shareable jewels. You know, they, we're not going to deprive them of, of, of the stuff. We have to be very judicious, again, because they have lots of stuff, like those ancient Egyptians. Jews didn't want to take their millstones and carry them across Sinai, it's difficult. They wanted gold because they could make a gold calf. <laughs> Moses was very annoyed with, with, uh, with the thing. So I, you know, but you, we need to find what are these precious things. And let me tell you, sort of part of the course is trying to explain to you how to find these wonderful jewels. I actually claim that in any discipline, old stuff is reliably good. It's like old wine is better than new wine. Well, not always, but you know, if you find a bottle of 1961 Chateau Petrus yeah, or Le Fitre Chill, go for it. It's really good. I don't think you will. Or if you will, I don't think you could afford it. But in mathematics, it's free. You could find Lefitre Shield or Chateau Margot for free. The best is free. And classical mathematics, mathemat Greek mathematics, mathematics of Euler, mathematics of Gauss, we'll encounter Gauss later on. This is so wonderful and provides the foundation for what we do. Sort of, I want to encourage you to, to look for this again. You know, it's not, it's nothing, you know, I don't get any uh, percentages from sales on Amazon of any <laughs> great mathematical books. I mean, even if I did, you know, the amount is, if I get 1% from every Euclid sold, I'll get $5 a year. So uh, it's not, we're not talking about huge sums of money, but I actually trying to rekindle. I'm sure that all of you, when you were young, believed there's something beautiful when you went to school. You're learning something wonderful. And then we, we become old and we say, oh, this is all not true. It's just about job and fixing bugs. You know, life and buying groceries. And I'm trying to wake you up because I think that these things are wonderful and will make you happier in the long term. And remember, what is good about the spoils of the Egyptians. Nobody could take a w them away from you. This, this, this stuff remains. Every beautiful theorem I learn, 
I'll carry it. Well, now I start realizing it's no longer true. I used to believe I'll carry it to my deathbed. Now I see them getting out, you know, every day. <laughs> so, but it's more or less true. So I am just, will it affect, again, there is a thing which I hear. There are doubters. There are people who, you know, over there in the outer darkness, go and say, no, this is ivory tower stuff. I could write Apache server or implement JavaScript without any math. And they're right, they can, especially JavaScript. <laughs> <I'm> a, <laughs> but, you know, if, if that's what you want, that's your, what you're going to get. But as my friend Paul reminds me every time, the founders of computer science, you know, for me it's easy, I'm sort of a mathematician and I tend to somewhat ignore founders of computer science, unjustly. But Paul wakes me up and says, Alex, but look at these people. They knew all of that. They really loved mathematics. Is it what you say? Even today on the train. Sort of, he said, no, people who invented compilers, people who invented operating systems, they loved and cherished mathematics. And people who invented computer science as a field, maybe not people who invented JavaScript, but people who invented computer science, Warm mathematicians. It's a tragic thing that we separated from mathematics. Tragic thing, in my opinion, for both. Maybe more even tragic for mathematics than for us. Well, it's tragic for both. It's difficult. It's a bad divorce. But I'm just trying to say, don't listen to these naysayers. Because they say, well, just go heck. You go get a job at Facebook. And on every wall, what does it say? Heck, this is true. That's what I write. In IBM, they used to say what? Think. No more. Now, heck, and there is another slogan at Facebook. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. Guys, it does matter if it's perfect. I mean, if you work on something, even if you're a carpenter, you want to make something, which is not because you want to be famous, but because it's what you do. I mean, we spend all our lives writing code. We want it to be perfect because it's, this is us. You know, this is not a preliminary life. This is life. I mean, all my life I was writing code. You know, when I look back and, you know, sort of, did I always write beautiful code? No. But I am ashamed for every shortcut I took. So don't do it. Don't listen. It's not, I mean, it's really, well, yeah, I could say, you could say, but does it pay? Does it pay to learn mathematics? I'll be very honest, no. <laughs> because who are the richest guys around? College dropouts. <laughs> I mean, we have an existence proof that in order to become rich, do not study anything. Drop out of college, start Apple, Facebook, Google, Schmuggle, whatever. I mean, that's, that's, that's what will make you rich. But on the other hand, you know, older you become, you will see that money might not be, again, I know it sounds ridiculous, but money is not everything, guys. So I really believe that we should aspire to, to the spoils of the Egyptians, to this mathematical stuff. And, you know, as much as we could get Try to apply it to our daily work, the end of the journey.